Hey guys, Dan here with another episode of the Video Business Accelerator podcast. Now this week, I'm pretty excited. We've got a guy called Simeon Quarry on with us. Now Simeon is the owner of Vividia in London. He's a filmmaker and storyteller, um, but he's also a Canon ambassador, an international speaker, a G Team member, and an advisor to Google and YouTube. He started life in weddings, but has successfully transitioned out of weddings into commercial work, corporate work. And he's always focused on staying ahead and now creates interactive virtual reality films for people like Sky, Barclays, Burberry, EY, and many more. Now, this is a two-part uh, presentation. We've got the first part this week and the next part will be next week. Simeon did this call at 3 a.m. in the morning. And I was like, God, my goodness, they must have got the times wrong. But no, he gets up at 2 a.m. every day to get in a good six to eight hours of work before everyone shows up in the office. Fascinating, fascinating episode. Um, certainly not something that I think I would do, but interesting insights as to how Simeon is adapting his business. And I think you'll find it's a really, really interesting episode. Um, so I'm excited to present this to you. So enjoy the show. Welcome to the Video Business Accelerator Podcast. Each week, we uncover the secrets to creating a wildly successful and scalable video production business with your host, Dan Lenny. Discover how the Accelerator program is transforming the lives of our members at www.videobusinessaccelerator.com. Enjoy this episode. Simeon, it's, it's awesome to... Uh... To, to finally get to speak to you. I feel like I've been sort of stalking you in, in a similar way in the last 10 years. You've been doing things, I've been doing things. We, and we may have met at trade shows, I'm not sure. But first of all, I just wanted to say welcome to the podcast and thank you for getting up at 2 a.m. <laughs> That's right, it's no problem at all. Uh, I'm, I'm an early riser now. I've, I've changed my behavior a lot over the last... Um, um, oh, actually... I've been doing these type of mornings just for a couple of months, but this is not unusual for me. So I start my morning now. I'm up at half past one in the morning. I'm in the studio for uh, two fifteen in the morning and work through till six. So this actually, um, despite the time zones if difference, uh, works amazingly for me. Fantastic. So let's start there because I'm I'm an advocate of getting up early, and I'm. Uh, you know, I've, I've I've been less so recently, but I've changed my lifestyle quite significantly. But I was very much in the five a.m. club, you know, getting up at five a.m. Mm. because I, I saw the value of the work I was getting done, the productivity I was seeing between five and seven. Talk to yes. me about getting up and starting work at two a.m. So I think one of the things is as you um, grow, you've got more voices in your business, right? You may be working with other team members um, and. Sometimes I get frustrated because there's so many things I need to do, whether it be from a creativity point of view or whether it be because I need to work, instead of working in the business, I need to be working on it, looking at the systems. Um, when you work during the normal part of the day, my all I get is email after email, call after call, Slack message after Slack message, Skype call after Skype call. It's a very, very noisy environment whereby you can't necessarily always do your best work or you can't necessarily strategically be thinking in the right way. So all of a sudden, by eight, nine o'clock, I've done a full day's work. That's really powerful, full day's, day's work. And then I double that up and I get two days work done. Um, there are experiments and technology and innovation and thought processes that I get to do because it's almost like my playtime. Um, and I, I've incorporated that into... Um, my my normal my normal day to day, so yeah, I balance it. You know, I, I'm probably do this realistically four four times a week, um, but even on the weekends, you know, with my family, I could I could le I could be in the studio for two fifteen on the weekend, and I could work through till eight o'clock, be with my family for quarter past eight in the morning when they wake up and rise, and then I can go and I can have the normal day with them. Um, also, it means that when I look at things that we want to do, whether it be creatively um, or from a business point of view, I don't have the same level of anxiety and fear because I feel like I can get this done. And where we are for Vida right now is, is that um, we've been working with video for a number of years and photography, but one of the new areas that we're really focusing on at the moment is one interactive filmmaking and storytelling 
by using virtual reality and the Oculus Rift, which involves a lot of 3D development, um, a lot of character design, environment design, motion capture. And then what we're also doing is we're now also turning those into animated movies because we were doing 2D animation, but now that's become like a 3D animation. So all of a sudden, when you land that client because you put that work in and you showed them something they like and you're up against a crazy deadline, all of a sudden you're like, yeah, we can get that done. Um, it's just because I'm, you know, I'm increasing on the day. Also, it's more cost effective, right? Because uh, I'm essentially doing two people's work. Um, so um, sometimes when you go through shifts and changes and you're trying to work out if things are working and if a certain business strategy makes sense, you can't always afford just to go and employ someone for X amount of thousand pounds. Um, so I'm doing that myself. Um, the other thing is, is that you can't systemize a, a process unless you understand what it is in the first place. So I can't delegate it. Um, I can't, um, you know, put it in a structured format so that it can be even acted upon. Unless in my case, I either employ an expert who knows much more about the, the situation than I do, um, which is hard when you're really innovating. The other thing I have to do, roll up my sleeves and I have to do it myself. Right, and understand it, understand those dynamics. And now I can go, right, you know something, I've got the option then of getting someone else to do those things and then going and doing it all over again or starting to do a little bit more normal hours. But so just to finish off, yeah. I was no, just going to say sorry. one final, final point is, you know, look, we hear that the Tim Cooks of the world and, you know, a lot of those CEOs, they're, they're a 3.45, right? Four o'clock a.m. And I look at them and I go, well, um, they are running businesses that are successful. Um, they are already hugely successful themselves. For me, they're in a totally different league. So I kind of think, um, why should I do less than them? Why should I do the same as them? In fact, I should be putting in more effort than them because my level of success is nowhere near their level of success. Um, and as a result, that's, that's you know a shift change in my behavior and thought process. I'd love to talk a bit about <clears throat> how you manage your energy uh, and, and what kind of <clears throat> lifestyle hacks you employ to get up at 2 a.m. And, and you mentioned before the call, you're up at 2 a.m., you finish at 6.30 p.m., and then you're back in bed by 9 p.m. So what kind of things are you doing to manage your energy and your like, nutrition? And I mean, sleep obviously is important. Um, mm. so talk to me about, about some of those things because you know, it's 2 a.m. and you, you, you're pretty, you're pretty kind of on the ball. And like, and most people would get up at that time and be like, you know, sluggish. It strikes me that this is something you, you're kind of very focused on from a sort of scientific perspective. So one thing I do is um, when that alarm goes off now, there is no snooze. I'm, I'm up and all of a sudden my brain's just like, right, um, I'm up. But the once you also, you do it a number of times, um, you, your body starts to, I've, I've got like stamina for it now. It doesn't become such an issue. I'm sure I take the little short naps, so sometimes if I really need to, sometimes I have to take a 15-minute nap two times a day uh, or a half an hour nap two times a day. But to lose half an hour or an hour during the course of a day when you've just gained another seven or eight hours, for me, is a, is, you know, it's a net win. Um, the other thing that really um, changed things a bit for me is attitude. So... Um, I, I sometimes I used to get up, you know, when you get up for shoots, you know what it's like, right? It's that one morning we're like, okay, it's a shoot. And you're like, oh, great. I've got good project come in, but it's that grind of, oh my God, I've got to load the bags or get in the vehicle. We've got to drive to location. And it becomes that really important um, day, but it's the anomaly, right? Because the reality is, is that often, unless you're a DOP um, and you, if you're running a production business, those short days, the shoot days are, you know, they're the smaller percentage of the overall behavior. But I would get up and I'd be driving in the vehicle and even if it was four in the morning, I'd be like, where are those people going? And you might see people and you know, they might be doing jobs in kitchens, they may be doing cleaning jobs and working on the transportation system. And then some of them are hustling and you realize that they're doing two or three jobs, right? And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Um, if they're doing two or three jobs in that hustle in order to succeed, what makes them do that? And then I thought about it. And I thought I've had a, you know, um, a unfortunate situation to have a daughter that was terminally ill with, um, with cancer and the medication that she was chosen. It was a throw of a dice as to whether we would be able to have the medication for her. And if we didn't get the medication, I would have needed to have raised half a million pounds 
in order to give her a chance of survival. And I know that if I needed to have done that in that circumstance, I would have done it. I would have got up whatever time of day, I would have hustled, I would have made it happen. Fortunately, she did survive. But then I realized those people are doing those things because they have to out of a survival instinct. I don't have to, but I should want to because I would, should want to do these actions on my own terms. Um, so I just decided that I was gonna do this um, on my own terms. The other most important thing for me is I absolutely love what I do. There is no place I would rather be than inside my Zen space, my studio, creating, experimenting, and doing what I do. So I shifted my work around to try and understand what it is that makes me tick and understand what I like doing. When I understand that, when I start to do those behaviors, I wake up every morning and I'm excited. I go to bed and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, tomorrow this is what I'm gonna try and do. I'm gonna see if I can do this. I'll see if I can achieve this. I'm gonna get these things crossed off my list. If for some reason I can't sleep by 10 o'clock, I get up and I come back into the studio. Cause believe me, if I go back to work again, I'll be tired at five in the morning and then I go to sleep and then get up again at eight, eight nine o'clock. Um, so yeah, love what we're, we're really fortunate as creatives in general, we love what we do. Um, so um, that's where I count myself as, as very lucky. And I'm sure most people in your audience do as well. I, I, I love that. And, and thank God your, your daughter, you know, got better. But it's interesting that when we're faced with health challenges, we, we suddenly have a massively different perspective. So I wanted to just kind of move on from that and talk about the team, because obviously you have a team. And, and, um, and when I was doing some research on this, this episode and we were chatting, you know, you've, you talked about growing and shrinking a team in your business to survive and thrive. And I think it's a really important part for, for, the, for the audience to listen to and watch because business in this space is cyclical. It's, it's, it's not impossible to have consistent work. I think it's absolutely possible if you put the right systems and process in place. But if you want to remain creative, there's, there's often the opportunity to, to scale up when need be. And I think I've certainly done it and perhaps you've done it as well, where we, we get the fancy office in the city. We think, hey, we'll have this prime address, we'll build this team, and then we can do the big projects. What's your experience of that? And what would you share with the audience? Wow, okay. I guess the first thing is I've built a business from being in weddings, then gone corporate and commercial and tried various different models. And, and yeah, I've, 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 I've had it all the way from me through to being multiple people, to being me, to multiple people, to being me, to be multiple people. So I've done it in a number of different ways. Um, you grow your team for a number of reasons. I, I think um, one is, is it's because you're looking at how much you need to achieve and there just isn't enough hours in the day. And, and if your business is primarily based in some ways, based on how much your, on your productivity, based on the hours there are in a day, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that you all of a sudden you potentially cap your, your abilities uh, because there are only a certain number of working hours in a day, even if you do some crazy hours, right? Um, so you end up trying to fill in those, um, fill in those gaps. Um, also, you need to maybe be able to consistently deliver a certain speed regularly for clients. So you need this certain level of, of, of infrastructure around you. Um, you also get sick sometimes of having to hire in talent very, very quickly, at a very, very high rate when a client needs something like that. You're like, okay, can I find... Uh, 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 uh. Uh, no, I'm really sorry, there's, there's no one available. What do you mean you've got no one available? Is this not the business that you're in? Is this not like me going into a restaurant and ordering some a meal from you and you turning around and saying, I'm really sorry, I don't have anyone in the kitchen in order to be able to do, to cook your meal for you. And for a lot of businesses, that 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 is inconceivable, particularly when you start to work with, with more corporate c clients. So I think there is, a, there is a business model where it makes sense to have a a skeleton crew in much the same way that you would you would have a you know you'd have the most important fundamental pieces of equipment to hand so that you can always be able to be in a position to do a job you may always go and get that you know extra special increased lighting you may decide to go and rent those additional lenses or those bits of equipment but you always look to have a certain level of equipment and infrastructure to be able to deliver at um, a level that is consistent but you have to also understand that 
you have to be prepared to also tuck that number up and down. And I and I've done the same thing. I've 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 grown it with the with the weddings because all of a sudden I was shooting and editing and then every time a telephone call came through i'd be like and i'm really sorry i can't really afford to talk to you right now because i'm in the middle of an edit and the deadline is due and then all of a sudden you're not getting the business in that you need to right because then that potential client that wants to do business with you can't because you've just put them off or you're not accessible so then i realized is no i need to actually focus on being more front end right i need to be front of house welcoming people talking to people trying to encourage and nurture that business so instead, what I would do is on a production side, I would maybe start off the first 10 or 15 percent, let someone else do the main bit of the work. And then I would check it over and bring it from the 80 percent to the 90 percent, because going to 100 percent is not always the most economical, doesn't always make good business sense. And, and so that was the process that I used in order to be able to to kind of scale up. I love the um, analogy with the restaurant, because <clears throat> you can't be the chef cooking the food and at the same time be welcoming people, marketing people to get them in the restaurant, welcoming them and serving them. And, and yet, so often, that's what video producers do. They, they're one man band, they, they're, they're so reluctant to, I think there's a fear of hiring anyone because of the cost and because there isn't, my, my theory is this, there's not a strong enough pipeline of inquiries, marketing inquiries and a sales pipeline to know what's coming to be able to predict revenue and cash flow, to therefore go, we can afford to pay someone. And that's something you must have gone through a few times, a few occasions. Yeah, so I, I, I partly don't fully agree with you in that I think that you can have a restaurant or let's say you can provide food for customers and do all the jobs. All you need to be is you need to be the, the, the burger store on the corner of the road, right? Or the hot dog stand. Right. Um, and, and, and then but what you have to do is you need to be aware and you need to build your business around that. So you can be front of house talking to someone whilst you're openly cooking. But what you need to understand is the moment you need to take the transaction, you actually need to stop. Right. And you have to fulfill orders maybe one at a time. And there is a business model that that works for. But just as you said, the really difficult thing is. Business can get. If you are stuck in the process of constantly having to do every process within the business in terms of work, accountancy, sales, um, doing the business, the moment you get that big bit of business, and I'm sure all your audience have been here, you get that great juicy piece of business and all of a sudden you're filming and then you're in the edit, you are unavailable, you are gone, right? You're not looking for the next piece of business and all of a sudden, a month later, when you come out and go, oh, you've got this beautiful clip, you can put it on the show reel, then you go, right, what's next? Oh my goodness, there's nothing next because you've not been servicing the sales needs of the business. And then as a result, you go, okay, great. So you've got that pot of money. The You're waiting for those 30 days for the money to come through. So you're a bit nervous. Then you're like, right, you're trying to hit the phones. You're trying to send out the emails. You're ringing up people going, is there any more work, etc." And then that process of getting new work might take three months, right? Um, money hits the account, great. And then over those next two months, that money that you just made disappears you're back to zero again, you're terrified, and just in time, you get a new piece of business again. And the same again, you repeat. So all of a sudden, you get these huge ebbs and flows. And sometimes, what terrifies you from getting someone, employing someone, is those ebbs and flows can be terrifying. So when you get that juicy bit of business, you get, oh, you get a bit confident, right? You go, oh yeah, this is fantastic. But then all of a sudden you come out of the edit and you upload it, you give it to the client and all of a sudden the money starts to do under down and you get terrified again. Cause you're like, well, if I had a, if I had a member of staff right now, this would not be working for me. Right. But the issue is that your pipeline is not great because you are not constantly working on the pipeline. So sometimes when you can break up elements of the process and you can decide that I'm going to dedicate, um, you know, 40, 50 percent of my time to maybe the marketing and the sales effort and to developing and nurturing a pipeline. All of a sudden, then you're in a position whereby ah, you can actually sustain and you can actually uh, maintain. And do you think that some of the challenge there is in I, I, I talk a lot with my <clears throat> clients about niche and, and sticking to a niche or sticking to a vertical or being in a particular part of the market so that you can leverage 
the network within that market. And and one of the challenges I think a lot of filmmakers face is they don't want to be seen as just doing one thing. Now in practice, even if you niche in the market, you never just do one thing. You always end up doing more. But when you niche, you're able to market to one person in one sector who's got a network. And when you do that, you can build consistency. What's your experience with the businesses you've run uh, or the, the different sectors you've been in in terms of small clients, big clients, and, and where are you today and what lessons have you learned along the way about that? And I love the analogy, 50% of your time should be on sales and marketing. I agree with you. So I have done it, ironically, when I was doing the wedding business is when I did it really right, right? Um, I did weddings and at first I decided I'm gonna do weddings. Okay, um, and then I decided, and I was getting a few jobs here and there, but then I decided, you know something, let me study, as a creative, let me study the marketplace. I studied the market and I came across this community, this Asian community, right? So Indian community. And I looked at them and I thought, hmm, there's a recession that's just around, just popping off here. Um, so that's going to cause issues. And a lot of the, the, the traditional English white weddings were going downhill, right? Because when they, they spend according to the income and the disposable income when it's related to weddings, but the Asian marketplace, oh no, they had saved in a trust fund from when their child was born. They'd put in a hundred pounds a month, whatever the figure was per month. So when their wedding hit of their daughter, it became hugely lavish in order to, to kind of show off for the community. They become the hosts for the community of 500 people and do this amazing wedding. So I thought, right, that community, the money seems to always be there, even if there's a recession. I then also realized that this community did multiple events. So I could get one wedding and have multiple events. So my cost per acquisition in terms of client had just plummeted. I also realized that the that community there, from a wedding point of view of filmmakers and photographers, they were slightly behind in thinking. They had taken a methodology from India, which meant that the bride hired one team and the groom hired another. Why? Because back in that culture, there was this sense of the arranged marriage, which essentially meant that the two families didn't know one another. So they're not gonna let the other side order the wedding services. So they independently choose creatives, even though that over the course of the 10 years, this had kind of changed, but the behavior was still the same. So I thought, you know something, how much budget do you have? They had a 100% budget just for the bride side that was totally correct for an entire wedding photography and filmmaking. And the groom had the same. So instead I went, I will take them both and I will give you a more consistent, holistic service. I was like, oh, my production value can go up, right? So that's what I did. And that what that meant, as you rightly said, is it meant that well, from a marketing point of view, I was talking directly only to my audience, right? So my communication, the language, the vocabulary, the dialect meant that it looked like I was, I was a solution that was designed specifically for them. The other thing that happened is when it came to advertising, um, you have to pay, you know, if I was going to advertise on Google with the term wedding video, the cost was, if I was to advertise with the term Asian wedding video, the cost was tiny because I was trying to target a very, very specific audience. Marketing for a very specific audience is much, much more cost effective. And I think sometimes when it comes to us as creatives, we start off in this position whereby we go, we just wanna create video. And what we don't do is we don't do what, if we've been using the restaurant analogy during the course of this conversation, what we don't necessarily do is go, right, you know something, location, location, location. What's the best location? If you were gonna set up a restaurant, you'd be looking at a location. What cuisine would make sense? What can I do as a cuisine? Um, and actually what cuisine would make sense for the area. Okay, now let's look at the ingredients that we're able to get hold of here in this location. What's, what's cost effective? And you make those really calculated decisions if you were gonna set up any other business. But yet for us as, as creatives, sometimes we just start. And as a result, it's not as effective. That's when I did it right. But when I started to service corporate and businesses, um, I was very much just a visual storyteller. It's a lot more wide. In some ways we were successful because yes, our projects shrunk a lot because our wedding fees were very high. They shrunk and then they grew. And then it looked like, yeah, we are to a certain extent quite successful because we were working with some of the very, very large companies and very large organizations. But we were nowhere near as effective as we could be because we was generalist. I also put that down to though, the fact that I didn't really understand one, what I wanted to do. So it was a little bit like um, dating, whereby you're not 
I did actually marry the first woman I, I fell in love with, but a lot don't, you know, they, they essentially, they, they try and understand what they like by trying different things and then they can, you can zone in. So I don't think you have to panic about going in immediately and zoning in straight to a niche market. If you're not really understanding where your strengths are or the target audience that, you, that really appeals to you, because you've got to love it. If you're going to go niche, you've got to love what you do. Uh, and, and then essentially during the course of, I, I then realized that I was, I was actually just far too loose, far too wide, and I wasn't as effective as I needed to be. I've now really worked much more on changing from this more generalized into something that's far more specific. Um, so now we're working with virtual reality and some of those storytelling. Our, our marketing is now really starting to shift again and starting to become much more focused. And as a result, we're already seeing better, um, better rewards. Awesome. Well, look, that's a great place to pause. This is so interesting. I feel like we're only halfway through. Let's pause here and take this to an ec another episode because I want to dig into marketing next. Simeon, thank you so much. You've been listening to the Video Business Accelerator podcast with your host, Dan Lenny. If you are a video business owner who is tired of going it alone and would benefit from mentorship, support, and weekly accountability, then mouse over to www.videobusinessaccelerator.com to learn more about how the Accelerator program can help you today. Don't forget to subscribe and rate the show over on iTunes. And we'd really appreciate you taking a few minutes to leave a review.